Hi there. Um, welcome to our Buddhist Recovery Network Academy, the December edition with Carol Kano, who has joined us to close out, to round out the summit of what has been a really incredible and memorable, memorable experience for, for me. I hope it's been inspirational for all of you. Um, here's Carol. Um, she began her practice over 30 years ago at Wat Khao Tham in Thailand and is actively engaged in building communities and teaching Dharma internationally. She's completed a myriad of training programs at Spirit Rock Meditation Center and is currently participating in their retreat center in their retreat teacher training. She's a core teacher and was a former board member of the East Bay Meditation Center. She co-founded Philippine Insight Meditation Community in the Philippines, and her unique teachings are deeply grounded in Basque, Native American, and Buddhist influences that brave the Dharma along indigenous wisdom and earth-based practices. Carol reminds us to keep grounded in our hearts as we uphold spiritual ideals and encourages us to remain balanced within the demands of modern life. And you can find Carol on her website carolkingman.com. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. I was wondering, I heard you say question and answer, and I can be quite long-winded. So if you could put the agenda timeline on the uh, chat for me, that would be great. So I can try to stick to it as close as possible. Thank you for that introduction. And if people would like to, you know, include their pronouns and Carol Kano go by she, her. I'm currently residing in the unceded land of the Romatosh Maloney, which is San Francisco. Um, and yeah, I like to just really humbly just, you know, um, just welcome you all for being here and continuing this beautiful uh, summit this weekend. And thank you for the invitation to um, be here to hold this hour with you all. My hope is that, um, that some seed is planted that embraces not only the Buddha Dharma, but also acknowledges the wisdom of the indigenous. So with that, I would like to start with a prayer. One, not only opening the calling of my own ancestors, but Many of you may or uh, may want to, or maybe it be the first to call upon your ancestors that may be blood lineage or one that is adopted, known or unknown. Even the tradition lineage that we hold, I myself am adopted Theravada lineage. Um, I hold the teachers that come before me all the way up towards the Buddha. And in honoring this calling upon the ancestors, I open my heart of the teachers of my own heart and tradition that continuously show me and point the way of the internal and external um, healing that's necessary in acknowledgement for my own awakening. As well as I call upon my ancestors, I also call upon the helping allies of the four-legged, two-legged, the many-legged, and the winged creatures and fen seen and unseen, for they have been great help for me on my path. I continuously also like to acknowledge Mother Earth and all other sentient beings that are here to support me, to support us on this path. May we feel motivated to connect with what is unseen and unknown yet very much supportive to our own life. I like to include the Lakota prayer. Wanka, Tanka, great spirit, teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, my intention, my intuition, my inner knowing, the sense of my body, the blessing of my spirit. Teach me to trust these things so that I may enter my sacred space and love beyond my fear, 
us walk in balance with the passing of each glorious sun. Oh, may it be so. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I invite you to settle into a position that is soothing for you in this moment, whether it's sitting, lying down, or standing, or even if your energy is restless or energetic, you may find a small walking path in front of your computer. And just take a few moments to really connect with the element of air, your breath, the element of earth, your body. Feeling the expansion of your own breath as it moves through your earth body. And grounding that to the external earth that holds us, grounds us, supports us in this life of ours. And as we ground in this moment, we may feel the element of water rising. Rising in the corner of our eyes. Or the sensations of, that exist in our mouth. That water supports us throughout this body. And even as I say that, we can connect with the element of water outside in our external world, Mother Earth, all the rivers that flow, oceans, ponds, streams, even a puddle of water, a city dwelling. Connecting with the internal element of water and is coexisting with the external element of water it's all around us, within us. We may even bring our awareness to the element of fire, where in our own terrain of this body, there may be heat, warmth, maybe even a lack of fire, coolness. And just noticing that within this body, that the element of fire may not be the same throughout the territory of your own body, just as the external earth. Bringing to life in this moment, this lived moment, 
that the elements exist within ourselves and externally. The reciprocity is here. What a gift. Through form and the formless. And on the cycle of life within us and all around us. Through these elements. The gift. Give you one more moment. Come to close in an honorable way by acknowledging that the session is coming to an end. The meditation. And I will ring a bell, just listen. Thank you. Just change to gallery view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So I know that that was just a taste, you know, and yet for um, from an indigenous centered practice, one that there, there, the framework of that is one we center everything relational. We don't exist on our own. And that includes the unseen and the seen, you know? So many of you from the Buddha Dharma practice, that's why I love braiding both of them. They are each a strand I hold. I hold three strands, the strand of 
of my Buddhist Theravedic lineage practice and the strand of my indigenous wisdom, ancestral knowledge. And the third strand is one of the great mystery that I practice and my love for the mystics even. So I, I, I braid this, this way. I weave a tapestry of my own spiritual path. And for many of you, you may have done the same as you're in recovery. Some of the stuff you aligned with and others you're like, mm, I don't know if I want this. <laughs> you know, there's, oops, sorry. I think I might've muted myself. So there is this, you know, curiosity that's here because it's our human nature to be curious. And as we go on a path of recovering ourselves, healing ourselves, you know, this path, you know, it can be daunting to what really one aligns with for one's own healing. So what I've learned is, you know, from an indigenous background, you know, it took me the Buddha Dharma, just give a little story. It took me at a very young age to travel very far away from this country and my family to come to the teachings of the Buddha. And it was through the teachings of the Buddha many years of that I, you know, came back to my own ancestral practice, came back home. Oh, Siri, <laughs> sorry about that. I came back home to my own ancestral lineages and spirituality and met many medicine people and elders. Both, I also met my Buddhist mentors and teachers and elders here. And I also was privileged to meet my Basque elder, which really helped me who was a cultural anthropologist, Angelus Arian, and who really you know, spent 25 years of research integrating indigenous wisdom from all four corners of the world, spent 25 research, years of research, really wanting to bring in the first cross-cultural modality called the fourfold way, modality for healing that we have more in common than not. And what is the wisdom from the old tradition? So how this braided way is really not letting, not keeping the old ways and not losing them, but also acknowledging what's new in modern times. And that can be confusing for many. So I'm gonna try my best not to confuse you. <laughs> so I apologize in advance if I do. So I thought about this, like what, you know, because this is, can be very rich, deep um, teaching. And I'm like, how do I condense that in such a short amount of time? And at the same time, what is going to be the most useful? Well, my understanding in this Buddhist summit is a Buddhist summit. So one of the things that I want to say is that I started to really think about like, you know, I've been thinking about this all year as things get tougher being in this pandemic. And um, that without the foundation of one's own ethics and sila, it's hard to stay centered. I could break that down, values and principles. But from a Buddha Dharma perspective, let's look at the five precepts, which Vel Velamathara teaches all the time. But just to remind you, I'll go through them quickly. I undertake the training of refraining from taking life or harming life. I undertake the training of refraining from stealing or taking which is not freely mine. I undertake the, the training to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the training from refrain, refrain, reframing from lying or harsh speech or slander or idle speech. I undertake the training from intoxicants and what causes carelessness and clouded mind. May my conduct be conditioned for an attunement to the highest fruits of my own liberation. 
and others. And when we look at these five precepts, we can look at another spinoff of these five precepts is the practice of harmlessness and compassion, the practice of kindness and generosity, the practice of faithfulness and responsibility, the practice of truthfulness and wise speech, the practice of self-control, and mindfulness. We're in a path of non-harm. And it includes ourself. And, you know, I, I just wanted to, you know, bring this foundation in this, this ground, like, what do I stand on? Unshakably, without question, that's rooted in my cultivation of wisdom. And that for me is the precepts. This has been my path of recovery myself or even actually reclaiming parts of myself I've not yet met and healing that that I wish to overcome. So it's a deep practice, it's an old practice and it's great medicine, I would say. And I remember his holiness, just to bring it home even more rooted. I had the great privilege of being in a small 100 people at Spirit Rock when he was visiting his holiness, when he used to give lectures at um, uh, Stanford with thousands of people. And he talked about burnt out. <laughs> that one hour meeting that he had with us at Spirit Rock. And um, beknownst to me, I was definitely on my way to burnout. <laughs> so I was volunteering everywhere. And, and it, was, it was like that talk was made for me. And when he talked about it, there was a moment of his, it, it, you know, there was a part of his talk that really caught my attention. And one was, you know, this burnt out, this way of being this non-harming, was that we put ourselves first, you know, to not burn out, that we're part of the equation from a selfful way. Those are my words, not a selfish way. It was, then he said, well, let me just finish this. Me first, relationship second, family and community third. I was like, what? <laughs> As a woman of color, family and community is number one. <laughs> Self is last, you know, at least in my cultural conditioning. And it was mind blowing because, you know, working hard on the path, I didn't realize, oh, I need to include myself here. And then he went on to say, if you don't include my, yourself, I have to include myself because I'm human, I'm not perfect. You know, he's like, I have this rash. It's not healed. I don't have magic. You know, he was saying, people think they want me to pray for them and their well-being. But he, and he laughed and giggled. He's very light and wonderful. And he's like, I'm just human. You see this rash? I can't even heal it myself. You know, so it was pretty cute, funny, and at the same time, very real. And he was just like, you know, if you don't put yourself first, then all the relationships you create is all delusional. It's diluted. Because they enter a relationship with you that is a false you. I was like, what? So my world was turned around that morning by his talk. And, you know, that self first is like that, you know, being on the airplane with the child and you want to put your mask on first and then put the child's mask. That's how you're helpful. So in many ways, we have to walk our own talk. We have to heal ourselves. And there's something about that, you know, if I can't put myself first, then, you know, the relationships I have, they see, you know, in other words, say another way of saying this is that, you know, I could be showing a mask of myself and entering a relationship. Everything's great. Everything's fine. 
And I keep saying yes to things, but inside I mean no. How many of you do that? Yeah. And every time we say yes, when we mean no, we lose a part of ourselves. But what really stood out for me is the fact that I'm entering diluted relationship with others. Every time I lose a part of myself, I'm not authentic. And in real teenage language, I ain't real. <laughs> That's just not being real. And there's a whole talk of what I think about what not being real can do because it really partners with the false self system. And, you know, um, so that made total sense to me. It changed my practice considerably to another level and my own self healing even to another level. And, you know, let me bring in a little bit of this false self work. Sorry, I'm old school. I, have, I like to have things written up in paper. <laughs> so, this false self system is something that it's not, you know, we're not cultivating authenticity, truth telling. We don't necessarily, we could see it in our, our culture today, you know, that it's radical to tell the truth. And it's also dangerous to be truthful. So we're at a time right now where we have to relearn how to claim our truth, know who we are, and stand by that. And I'll say another layer about standing by one's truth is that when we can be who we are and stand by our own truth, and be real, we start to build relationships with others in a way that creates safety. So it's just something to sit with. This false self system starts out like we start rehearsing and editing and we start thinking. I know we even close to ourselves off certain emotions. We start performing for certain people. Notice who that might trigger, anyone that it may bring up. I mean, a good example of that is when you go on a date for the first time, you bring your best selves, you know, here are two, you know, puppets right here, their best dress self, and you want to look good, and you want to play good, you want to feel good, you want them, you don't want them to know the real you just yet. But when you're talking about recovery, it seems to be a perpetuate beyond dating. You know, it's like we start to feel scared to show our true selves. And we ourselves are scared of our true selves because, you know, addiction can bring you all the way down. And for some reason, some of, I, some of us have identified heavily of them being us. In fact, it's just a part of you one part of you, it's not all of you. So we lose what all the other parts of ourselves are. And the parts of ourselves that is pretending or rehearsing or editing or scared to let go of these ways, it, it's, it's really, let me just go back, it's really this false self system is a system that perpetuates self-abandonment. And when we come to healing ourselves, we, we come to really getting to know, reacquaint ourselves with ourselves and to um, reclaim the good parts of ourselves. It's hard. So the healing, uh, you know, there's, there's somewhat a lot of healing around this place of self-abandonment. And when we involve these patterns of self-abandonment, truth-telling eclats. 
it collapses, as we all know. And those patterns are hard to release, they're hard to let go. And you know, my understanding is my own practice of it, you know, because it is a practice. I just want to say I love the word practice because it is a practice to start to really be truthful, to be honest. And we have great fears to not do that because we may lose relationship. We fear losing, we fear loss of love, we fear um, not having approval, acceptance. So we continue to parade and pretend or live up to some really um, high expectation part of ourselves. It just gets in the way of us healing, let alone recovering. And so when I think of this false self system, I think of, you know, how I perpetuate my own self-denial, sometimes in the form of keeping the peace. It's still a self-abandonment act. So just, you know, acknowledging where we are when we are pretending to be where we're not for the love of someone else, for the acceptance and approval of another, for keeping the peace for keeping things in harmony, avoiding conflict. So it's a big practice, this cultivation of truth, let alone trust, trust in oneself, trust in one's heart. So there's a practice that, you know, from Dr. Leslie Gray, she calls it, you know, practicing spirit tongue, just like the heart is very lean. The head, of, again, loves to tell a good story. It lives in the past, in the present. I mean, who doesn't love a good story? <laughs> it has, you know, it's your own 500 channel cable, your mind. <laughs> And, you know, can we trust it? <laughs> I just wanted to like, I think I would much rather just go from here to here, drop down into my heart and trust that more because the heart is lean. It's to the point it knows. And in our meditation practice, it's the one that is cultivating through silence and stillness of the mind and the body and letting the debris of the, thoughts and the debris of the past and the debris of regrets and the debris of pain and suffering to let go just to just dissipate a little and maybe maybe when we really can feel a little bit of silence even if it's just five seconds it could feel like a minute and that minute can you know in cultivation can feel like five Feel like you want to breathe? <laughs> just felt like my breath there. So this spirit tongue is that learning to speak one's truth from a place of coming from our own heart. And it's okay, the mind can be my best friend, you know. And you know, and um it could be many things, but I also know that the cultivation of the heart is, is where the power for me is, that it lies, the empowerment of my gaining. Who is, who, who am I? And so when I think of um, the false self system as a place of practice, it's really, it's a strong practice. It's a practice of really learning how to look at our own limited behavior patterns. You know, and one thing about indigenous um, practices, we practice everything based on the cycle of life, like the cycle of the seasons, 
the cycle of the moons, the cycle of our medicine wheel, you know, the cycle of directions. You know, nature mimics this. For me, nature is one of my greatest teachers. So we're in the season of fall at the cusp of season of winter. And there are many indigenous traditions that believe, and even in the Buddha Dharma, deeper practices, long, long, you know, um, what they called in the monastics, you know, the rain seasons practice. We go into solitude for several months to practice. It's also the same indigenously that the seasons bring in great awakened moments for us when we can attune to or the external world that mirrors our own nature. So in the season of fall, you know, fall, it's the time of harvesting and letting go. A lot of indigenous traditions in all four corners of the world practice some ritual and ceremony around harvest and letting go. And we see nature doing that. The trees, the leaves are falling. The trees even now are becoming bare. But underneath the soil is the richness of life. Just because the tree lost all its leaves doesn't mean it's died, it's fully alive. So what we plant in the fall is seeding to come spring through in the spring. So what is it that you're planting right now for yourself to heal, to gather, to nourish? And also in the season of going into winter is when we go into deeper contemplative practices of silence and solitude. And there is a difference between solitude and isolation. Solitude is self-retreat, isolation is choosing to be cut off. Which are you doing? Sometimes we're not awake to that. So knowing the difference is also learning to choose for yourself a tool that is useful to be in solitude, to have contemplative time, quiet time to also be in coexistence with nature, spending more time in nature so that we can see the mirror of our own nature that lies within ourselves. And if many of you do a great hike wherever you're at and you're by your favorite vista or you go to a beach or you go to a park or you're at a tree or in your backyard and you take that moment, there's nothing quite like it. It's quite beautiful. Wow, I can't believe the time is already coming to an end. <laughs> just, I'm just getting started. Um, and I just, I feel like right now I wanna say that, you know, there's this, this practice of the path of least harm, which includes you know, uh, uh, reclaiming yourself and being real, authentic, although it may be scary. You know, there, this also is the season for many traditions, a season of reconciliation, a season of forgiveness, self-forgiveness. One, you know, one of the teachings that I wanted to say was, um, let's see where I have it here. I say it all the time, so I know it is, um, we can't, you know, when we have our heart closed and not open, there is recovery work to be done, like reconciliation and forgiveness. And for me, I could never, I'm not saying forgiving another, I'm still talking about self-forgiveness. And there are many times I had done actions or made bad choices and I just did not forget. They just kept accumulating in my own heart, hardening it, literally closing it. 
cutting myself off from it. So it's just that, you know, simple act of forgiving myself for even being in the Buddha Dharma word, ignorant to even the realization that I was doing what I was doing in that moment. And what I love about the elements of practice, practicing the elements is that it's more, it's, there's more in, that is coexisting in me that remembers. See, another thing about indigenous in, you know, knowledge is that we've always believed that there's not only the mental intelligence, there's the physical intelligence, there's the spiritual intelligence, there's emotional intelligence way before all those books started coming out <laughs> and all that research. We've believed in four rivers of intelligence flowing through us all the time. And so what the practice of the elements do is it opens up us up to other aspects of ourselves, the formless that the Buddha talks about a lot and how we can ground in that and how we can see it in nature ourselves and ground with it and resolve and forgive and, and create forgiveness and let go and let go of these behavior patterns, whether it's behavior patterns of, you know, um, being closed off, numb, uncertain, confused, allowing us to gain some clarity. And I think I'm okay, a little bit more that I'm going to close. Um, yeah, I mean, this practice of letting go is really a deep practice. It requires us to really acknowledge what's here in the first place. And by doing that, we have to acknowledge what we haven't. And in order to do that, we have to be still enough and quiet enough to see what's here. And so this this, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, we're in a great transition right now, not only on a bigger scale, um, but on a, on a, on a, you know, personal scale, the bigger scale is we're in this pandemic, the world has forced us to like, you know, we've been, as my uh, b beloved friend, Mabali would say, who's an elder medicine woman is like uh, um, Pachamama sent us to our rooms in the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> I love when she said that. It's, it's actually, she, we got sent to our rooms by Pachamama. <laughs> and we're all like freaking out, just like, like a seven-year-old I have in my life when he's like put on timeout. <laughs> and, uh, and we're all like with ourselves and have to cope with it. And, you know, and I remember seeing a friend of mine from India sending me a video when everything, we were all closed down in the beginning of the pandemic. And there's a big elephant in the suburbs of Delhi. She sent me a video of going through the suburbs and people are like looking at it, freaked out, running the other way. It's like, what's the elephant doing here in my neighborhood? And, you know, because I'm sure all the creatures in nature is like, God, it's so quiet. <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> and they stepped out to look. And so you're seeing all these, you know, four legged everywhere going, What's happening here? Because we got sent to our room and things got clearer. Pollution, for one. And here we are, two years, coming up to two years. So. And not much have changed. And I believe it was um, Adruth Hiti Roy who said in her article that, you know, basically that we have gone through this portal, an initiation, global initiation, 
that we can look at it as such. And when I think about it, I want to use her words, you know, because this is this it's so beautiful. It's like this idea that we have entered this pandemic as a portal, as an initiation for all of us. And she says that, you know, it's portal is a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it or drag our old cockroaches of our prejudices and hatreds and, and data banks and dead ideas and dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, just dragging. Or we can walk through lightly with light luggage, ready to imagine another world. So part of this reclaiming is reimagining, re reclaiming, rewriting. And as I led um, a talk with Conda Mason, I think it was just last week for us at Braided Wisdom, was um, on restorative economy. And she says, you know, all this stuff was made up in terms of economy and finance. That was our whole talk was restorative economy. We can reimagine it to be different. We can redesign it. We can rewrite it. Just when I was just coming to a point of like, so much violence in the last couple of weeks again and again. It's just hard to witness worldwide what's happening. And I was starting to feel when I started the conversation with restorative economy with her, it was like, and the road is long. And I could feel my body just going down and down. And the road is long. And then just hearing her saying, that she just said she invited us to reimagine. And that's what is happening here when Aruti Roy would talk about the pandemic is a portal and aligning with, you know, indigenous knowledge and wisdom. That's an initiation process. We're being initiated. In the language of, of um, Joseph Campbell or Michael Mead, you know, that initiation takes us through the dark night of our soul. Some don't make it out, but some do. So we're going through this, what Joseph Campbell calls this hero journey initiatory process to reclaiming ourselves and the path may be hard at times and long so why i started with the foundation of one's sila one's ethics the precepts and holding on to that ground beneath you as your root your feet are planted and the roots are dropping down to nourish you and to be open and connected to all the elements in this life, to choose to go to solitude and self-retreat, not to be cut off or numbed or closed, but to be open-hearted, to be discerning, to invite the openness and a trust to the great mystery of life. to really practice this practice in such a way that it ignites the dreamer, the imagination in a way that comes, that's aligned with your own truth and your heart that's seeped in sila, path of non-harm. So I'm going to stop there because I know it's like nine minutes left and there's so much more to say around this work. I mean, it's a big framework, but keep it simple, keep it real. You're worth it, all of you.
We need you. We need each other. We can't do this alone. Thank you. And uh, once again, I would offer our website, BuddhistRecovery.org slash donate. And I'll do that screen share one last time very quickly. Um, and then I just wanted to say that I can normally can tell you who's going to be teaching next. We're going to have a couple of changes next year. I am going to, um, we, we have a new, um, a new host and that will be Susanna. She actually facilitated uh, the codependency panel a short while ago. Um, and so in honor of trying to bring in more of Europe and UK and Finland and, and, and making this uh, more accessible to people around the globe, we're actually going to be changing the time. And I think that it's going to be 10 a.m. Pacific time. Goodness, Sarah, if you uh, have an affirmation of that, that'd be great. But um, so we'll, we will be announcing some programming as soon as we have it. Yes, it's 10 a.m. Pacific. So the time is shifting a little earlier. Um, and then I just wanted to encourage you that uh, to check out our um, Facebook page and our website and come back for the event announcements uh, so that we can let you know who's who's going to be leading next year. And um, I really wish you all well. I wish, um, may be safe and happy and healthy through the holiday season. And um, may you connect in meetings and community as, as needed to support your recovery. And a beautiful weekend spending it with you. And uh, yes, we have um, the Buddhist Recovery Network actually has uh, one meeting every Wednesday. It's kind of a rotation of the different, um, the main uh, recovery groups. And we also have a BIPOC meeting on, um, so it's Wednesday at 5.30 Pacific, and then we have our BIPOC meeting on Saturdays at noon Pacific time. So um, yeah, reach out to us um, and thank you for being here. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's all turn the microphones on and say a big thank you and a big goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. 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 Thank you.